Mr. President, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly, warmly welcome you to this annual meeting's opening press conference. My name is Olivia Ndong Obian, and as the head of media of the African Development Bank Group, it's my pleasure to invite our president, my president, Dr. Akinwimi Adesina, to briefly address you before the session for questions and answers. Mr. President. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, let me welcome you to this um, press, uh, press conference this morning. Um, for many of you, I just was talking to a friend of mine who just got up there. He just arrived from France this morning. I know so many of you just arrived. Very, very long trips. Soyez le bienvenu pour les Français qui sont dans la salle. Your point school, ce sera une grande réunion pour nous. And it's going to be a great meeting. Let me say that the African Development Bank uh, has just, just, I was just coming in, we just launched the African Economic Outlook. And it's very important that I say what the key issues are for the African Economic Outlook so that you get to put this meeting in great perspective. First and foremost is that the, what is the status of African economies today? If you take a look at African economies, African economies have been growing roughly in the last decade at 5%. But recently, because of the declining commodity prices, the growth has slowed down a little bit. And so by last year, African economies grew at 2.2%. But our projections, which is coming from the report that we just launched, shows that African economies will grow back at 3.4% this year. And that growth will rise to 4.3% in 2018. Now, you have to put that in perspective of the global environment. The global growth rates in terms of GDP growth globally in 2016 was 3.1%. For this year, it's projected by IMF to reach 3.4%, at uh, 3.5%, and then it will reach 3.7% uh, by 2018. So all that tells you that African economies are doing relatively well in a very challenging global environment. Africa's head is above the water. Africa is doing well. The economies are very resilient. Next thing I want to say is that African economies, Africa is not the same continent. It's, not, it's, not, it's a continent. It's not one country. If you look at the growth rates that I've just told you about Africa, it's actually quite heterogeneous when you look at the countries themselves. Let me give you some numbers that will really shock you. Ivory Coast is growing at 8.3%. If you look at Ethiopia, it's growing at 8%. You take a look at Kenya, it's growing at 6%. Rwanda is growing at 6%. Tanzania is growing at 7.2%. Djibouti is 6.3%, Senegal 7.2%. That just tells you that you can't generalize when it comes to Africa. African economies are performing well. In fact, four of the five fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa today. Let me also say that when you take a look at it, the numbers, furthermore, 14 countries out of African countries grew last year at above 5%, 14 countries. And 18 countries grew over at 3 to 5% last year. That just tells you how much diversity you have in the growth process uh, in Africa. So African economies are doing quite well, and they are quite stable and very, very resilient. The second issue that I want to mention is about investments. Investments are very, very important. Foreign direct investment continues to grow in Africa. Africa continues to be the second fastest growing region in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. That foreign direct investment by this year will actually reach $57 billion, so only second to Asia. So very, very important to recognize this. And the reason you're finding this is because African countries are doing the right things. 
in terms of business and regulatory environment improvements. Today, 30%, 30% of all the global improvements in business and investment regulatory environment happened in Africa. So Africa continues to be the place absolutely to be. We are right here in India for this annual meeting of the African Development Bank. And obviously for me, I'm even more delighted to be in India because I started my international career right here in India in 1988 when I was based in Hyderabad at the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics. So for me, it's basically just back at home uh, in India. But why India and why, why, why Ahmedabad? Let me say why India because the theme of this annual meeting is about agriculture and how to make agriculture a business, a viable business. India has shown the rest of the world that it, can't, it took its agriculture from where it used to be dependent on food imports, and India became totally self-sufficient in food. Not in 10 years, not in 15 years. India did it in three years. It just tells you what can happen where there is political will for action. And so we are here to draw inspiration from that green revolution that happened in India and to also encourage African countries that they can have that green revolution that is adapted to Africa's own situation. Why is this very important for the annual meeting? Agriculture for, the, for Africa is so crucial. Africa is spending today $35 billion in importing food. If we don't do anything, the amount that Africa spends importing food will rise to $110 billion by 2025. I'm sure you will agree with me that that makes no sense. Africa should not be importing food. Africa should be a net exporter of food. And why? I don't plan to be around by 2050. I don't know how things are going to be in 2063, in 2070. I don't know. But I do know what can change in the next 10 years. Is that in the next 10 years, Africa absolutely have to fit itself. It has to turn that around. And that's why this annual meeting, it's very, very important. And so I'll be looking forward to interacting with you and the rest of the meetings about, about this particular issue. Let me also talk about the importance of the high fives of the bank. Feed Africa is one of the five pillars of what we call the high fives at the bank. Our five strategies is to light up and power Africa, to feed Africa, to industrialize Africa, to integrate Africa, and to improve the quality of life of the people of Africa. And so we are only focusing on the issue of Feed Africa, which is the second high fives of the bank. Now, but let me also say a few things about that area. Where are the areas that you'll be hearing from us in the next few days? You'll be hearing about what we are doing in encouraging young people to get into agriculture as a business. Because I believe agriculture is cool. It's the coolest thing that you can you know, have as a profession. Medical doctors will even tell you that. Take three tablets three times a day, but only after food. It tells you how important food is. The second thing that I want to say is that you'll be hearing about us about how to make agriculture a business that can unlock huge income benefits for the people of Africa. Why is this important? It's important because the size of the food and agricultural market in Africa will rise to $1 trillion by 2030. $1 trillion by 2030. That tells you that's where the millionaires and billionaires of Africa should be coming from. They should be coming out of the agricultural sector with that kind of, of figures that I've just given to you. I also will be hearing from us about how to get women into agriculture and how to encourage them in agriculture. You'll be hearing quite a lot about how to get innovative financing into agriculture to be able to make it a real business. And finally, you'll be hearing from political leaders and we have quite a few of them that are coming. The president of Benin is going to be here. The president of um, Senegal is going to be here. And the vice president of Cote d'Ivoire is going to be here. You'll be hearing from African leaders about the importance of political will. 
because it was that political will that helped India to fit itself within three years. Political will you'll be hearing about throughout the rest of this meeting. Let me say a few words about us, the bank, and what we have done you know, in the last one year. In the last one year, the bank is in a stronger situation than ever before. We're solid. We're doing a lot of work with great impact on the ground. Let me just give you some of what we're doing. Last year, the bank approved in total $10.5 billion in terms of approvals for loans and investments that we are making. That is the highest in the history of the African Development Bank. The bank last year also approved, I mean disbursed money out of the door, $6.5 billion. This is also the highest in the history of the African Development Bank. We approved, we disbursed $6.5 billion, which is the highest in the history of the bank. Let me also say that the bank itself maintained its AAA rating last year. We continue to maintain that AAA rating. It's what allows us to be able to raise money from the international capital markets to finance our work. And last year, the bank raised $10.5 billion from the international capital markets to finance its work. It just tells you how well we're doing. The income of the bank is rising more than before. Our net income as a bank grew from $192 million in 2015 to $285 million by 2016. It just tells you how well the bank is doing. Let me close by saying a few words about the future and what you will hear throughout this meeting. It's about investments. Africa is ready for investments, and that's why the African Development Bank is launching what we call the Africa Investment Forum, which is going to help to mobilize global pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, institutional investors, insurance companies to invest in Africa. Africa is where the biggest deals to be made in the world are, are going to be. And as African Development Bank, we want to be there to support private sector to make these critical investments in Africa through the Africa Investment Forum. Let me thank you, the press, for being here. The press, you are the most important, actually, VIPs that I know of. And I'm glad that you're here to help us tell this story. So welcome to the annual meetings of the African Development Bank. And I hope those few remarks help you to make your story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. So now is the session for questions and answers. And please introduce yourself, give the name of your media, before asking your questions. For the Indian press, feel free to ask questions in local languages. My colleague here will translate. Thank you. Hi. Stand up, please. Uh, Nick, Nick Norbrook from the uh, Africa Report. Um, it's a fantastic figure, the 6.5 billion in disbursements. We hear that Africa needs 80 billion a year just in infrastructure. Um, is that why you need to raise the capital base of the AFDB, and how is that process going? Thanks. Is this working? Yeah, well, you know, first and foremost is we are pretty good as a bank in using our capital. If you look at the leverage ratio for every single dollar that the African Development Bank is given in terms of capital, we, 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 we leverage that four times in terms of equity leverage ratio for us. So we're pretty good in doing that. The second thing is that to mobilize the resources that are going to be needed, the balance, the gap, roughly about literally almost $80 billion gap in terms of financing, we are doing quite a number of things. First and foremost is that the bank is using its instruments in terms of guarantee facilities. We guarantee the private sector to reduce their risk of actually lending into the, uh, 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 within Africa. So we do quite a lot of partial risk guarantees and also partial credit guarantees. Also linked to that on infrastructure is that the bank, uh, as you know, set up a private equity platform for infrastructure that is called Africa 50. Um, Africa 50 is doing well, and Africa 50 in the last um, 
uh, one year has mobilized $853 million, which is going to grow to a billion dollars by the end of the year. The other thing that we are doing to close that financing gap is syndications. Last year, the African Development Bank led eight banks to do a whole syndication of $1 billion for ESCOM, which is the utility, South Africa's utility, which is the highest in terms of syndicated AB loan ever in the history of Africa. So we'll continue to do more in terms of that. But equally important is the need for co-financing from others. We've been quite successful in that. We have uh, China uh, is investing with us in what we call the Africa Growing Together Fund, uh, which is $2 billion. Uh, we have the um, Enhanced, uh, from, from, from Japan, a program that's called EPSA, Enhanced Private Sector Support uh, for Africa, uh, which is uh, $3.3 billion of co-financing with the, with the bank. And we also have Korea. Uh, Korea is put up $5 billion over the next uh, three years to also co-finance with us. So in summary, what I'm saying is that we are stretching our balance sheet. We are co-financing with others. We are syndicating with others. But at the end of the day, we realize that, you know, you can't get water out of the rock, right? So at the end of the day, there's going to be the need, obviously, for the bank to have a general capital increase. And I know the issue is the timing of that, and our Board of Governors uh, are, are thinking about that. But make no doubts about it. This bank is fit for purpose and delivering big impacts for Africa. Introduce yourself, give your name and the name of your media. Yes. <laughs> Sir, yes. how much is India investing? Investing where? Investing, I know you told that Korea is investing in... Uh, oh, okay, all right, good. Well, let me, let me say first and foremost that India is a very important partner uh, for the African Development Bank. Um, India joined the African Development Bank and the African Development Fund uh, in 1982 and 1983, respectively. So India has been a long-term supporter of the African Development Bank. Um, let me say it in uh, two different ways. Uh, take the African Development Fund, which is the fund we use to support low-income countries. Um, last year, November, Indian government provided $27 million dollars to that African Development Fund replenishment, which is a significant increase uh, for the Indian government. Secondly is, let's talk about it in terms of investment, real investments, because at the end of the day, what matters is not just aid money. What matters is investment money. And India's investment in terms of bilateral trade with Africa has been rising and will continue to rise. You know, 2006, you know, 2005, 2006, India's bilateral trade with Africa was $11.7 billion. But by 2016, that had grown to uh, $56.9 billion. That tells you the pace at which uh, India's investments and trade investments are going. We expect that investment to rise to trade, bilateral trade with India to rise to over $100 billion by in the next two years. And that's why I want to highly commend Prime Minister Modi for the terrific job that he's been doing with the India-Africa partnership uh, when he had the India-Africa Business Forum here uh, for which he announced $10 billion for export credits uh, to be done for India. And lastly, let me just say on the, when it comes to the issue of what India is doing on investment is Indian companies are working a lot in Africa. I, I lived in, in, in Kenya. And I saw all the time a lot of Indians uh, in, in, in Kenya. Indian businesses are investing in infrastructure, in rail, in pharmaceutical industry, in ICT industry. And Indian companies are also investing in agriculture. So I'm delighted to be here, uh, not only to talk about the, what Africa is doing, but also talk about what India is expecting to do. So I'm Himanshu. I'm uh, running my own uh Hotel Services, Dateline Gujarat, with dedicated <coughs> talks for the business news from Gujarat domain. So, uh, rightly what you said, you know, the, the need is to feed the African community in totality. You want to bring in the growth. 
there is a kind of you are emerging as a second region as far as the investments go, the foreign direct investments. How crucial is the energy sector for you or for the African development banks? And what kind of pivotal role will the energy financing play in your, this whole gambit? Because when you think of feeding the entire African community, you know, it's like a general calculation of one kilo energy, I mean, one kilo food consume, uh, one calorie food consume consumes 10 calories of energy. So how would this be a crucial balancing factor for AFDB now from here? Because well, again, as you said, you know, the commodity prices are also uh, kind of paying some resistance to the growth story of the world. Well, thanks for your question. Um, when it comes to the issue of energy, Light Up and Power Africa is the first priority of the African Development Bank, and for good reason. Today, you have 645 million Africans that do not have access to electricity, and you can't develop in the dark. You can't industrialize in the dark. You can't learn in the dark. And so we made the decision that we are going to invest heavily in the electricity sector, power sector, energy sector. The African Development Bank is investing $12 billion in the energy sector over the next five years. And we expect to leverage anything between 45 and $50 billion uh, from that sector. Second is we want to connect 130 million people to the grid. I mean, households to the grid. And we also want to use off-grid systems, especially those that rely on solar systems. We want to connect 75 million households to power via the off-grid systems. Now, India's role, it's important in this. Prime Minister Modi launched what's called the International Solar Alliance, uh, for which the African Development Bank is discussing with the Indian government. And we hope that $2 billion out of the $10 billion that Prime Minister Modi announced uh, towards that International Solar Alliance can be used to support Indian businesses working with the African Development Bank to be able to accelerate work on the renewable energy space, which is the, the one for the, um, uh, for the solar, uh, solar energy. And finally, I just want to say that the other part of the energy story is that the African Development Bank today is actually leading in terms of renewable energy. And that renewable energy is very, very critical because we've set up what is called the Africa Renewable Energy Initiative, which is based within the African Development Bank to mobilize $10 billion just for renewable energy. And how about the oil please, and gas please, sector? Sorry, uh, very many people here. Okay, want, thank, thank Angel, you. please, a woman, please, huh, dear colleague, a woman. Hello. Um, there seems to be a shift Wait, leading. Introduce yourself. My name is Angel. I'm from The Guardian, based in Tanzania. There, shift, there seems to be a shift leading to a possible increase in, fin in financing international financial institutions, such as World Bank and IMF for supporting agricultural and rural development projects. What do you think would be the impact of such a shift on the policy priorities of regional organizations? Well, you know, when it comes to financing development, um, I'm a firm develop, uh, a believer in the fact that, you know, your friend may love you to death, but your friend will never send your kid to school. Africa has to mobilize huge amount of resources, domestic resources, to fast track its development. And if you take a look at how much resources are there in Africa, they are actually quite significant. Today you have a total of $334 you know, billion that's there in pension funds in Africa. You have sovereign wealth funds in Africa, it's roughly about $164 billion. And the pension funds in Africa are projected to rise to $1 trillion by 2030. But for me, it makes no sense when sovereign wealth funds in Africa are investing their funds outside of Africa, but not in Africa. So they are helping the other sovereigns to grow except themselves. And so what we want to do and what we are doing at the African Development Bank is to be able to achieve the high five uh, targets that we want we absolutely have to mobilize a lot of domestic financing within the continent. So getting the pension funds and sovereign wealth funds to invest in Africa, in infrastructure, in power, in road, in rail and ports, 
is going to be very, very important. The second thing has to do with the way in which the international community supports Africa. Um, I think in particular, let me talk about the issue of climate change because we're facing that issue uh, right now uh, in Africa. Um, I think that global financing, climate financing, for cl climate adaptation is urgently needed in Africa because Africa is, is as you see, having quite a lot of drought and uh, a lot of uh, situations because of climate change. So I really believe that um, a lot more climate financing is going to be needed uh, for African countries. Now, there's no doubt that in the, some of the donor countries, you know, with migration, uh, with domestic pressure that they have, you know, are, are looking at how to readjust. But I think the time for Africa is actually now. We can't slow down on Africa's development. We have to accelerate fast pace on Africa's development. So if there's any time to engage in Africa, it's now. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Andual Msisa from Ethiopia. I represent New Business Ethiopia and Nation Media Group of Kenya. <laughs> My question is about the GDP growth, uh, growth that uh, we saw on uh, the report that you just launched. Uh, you said, uh, for instance, in Ethiopia, the growth is around 8%. Uh, but this GDP growth does not tell the real story about uh, people's lives on the ground. Uh, as you know, the recent unrest in Ethiopia is caused, as the government also uh, uh, confirmed, that it's caused by, because of unemployment uh, increasing. So how do you think that uh, this government should handle the growth, uh, not to f only to focus on GDP growth and uh, showing infrastructure uh, uh, by getting credit from external and uh, they continue exclude, if they continue excluding the people and they are not inclusive in this growth, this GDP growth can be attained by only a few uh, millionaires or billionaires uh, can attain this GDP growth. So do you think there should be another approach or uh, any suggestions for such governments? Thank you. Well, you know, I mean, first and foremost is you can't but grow, you have to grow. Uh, because the only way in which you can actually cut down poverty is to continue to grow. And I think this, the storyline is very clear that for African economies, they are growing and are doing well. Even in Ethiopia, at 8, 8%. What we need to do a lot more of is to make sure that, that growth is actually quite inclusive. And that, that growth actually translates a lot into job creation for the young people. And I'm particularly concerned about the young people uh, because of their numbers that are rising. And the fact that you know, a third of Africa's young youth today you know, don't have uh, uh, you know, uh, good jobs, and a third of them are discouraged, and only one-sixth of Africa's youth has wage employment. And so a lot of work needs to be done, and I think that's what the African Economic Outlook Report says, in building skills, entrepreneurship, financing facilities for young people. We've got to invest in young people. Secondly, is that we have to transform the rural areas. When you're growing, you have to make sure that you're not growing only in the urban areas. So a lot of work is needed in rural development, rural infrastructure, agricultural transformation, because that's how you will be able to lift literally hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And third is that for to be able to grow well in a way that's inclusive, you have to support small and medium-sized enterprises, because that's where almost 90% or the businesses are in Africa. Now, these small and medium-sized enterprises don't have access to finance. That's a problem. You know, you take a look at them, only 60% 60, 60 of them depend on borrowing money from banks at a very high rate. Only 2% of them are borrowing money for long term to grow their businesses. So we have to make sure that small and medium-sized enterprises have access to finance to have inclusive growth. And finally, is that the nature of the growth process. You have countries that are in the coastal areas, you have countries that are also landlocked. We have to make sure the growth process is such that the landlocked countries are able to grow by investing more in infrastructure. And that's why the African Development Bank continues to invest a lot in roads, in rail, and ports to connect landlocked countries to the coastal countries. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Oui. Je suis Ismaël Abba, journal de l'économie sénégalaise, Le Gécos. Il y a un an, Monsieur le Président, vous disiez, je cite, que la BAT était au service de ces millions d'Africains qui n'ont pas accès à l'électricité et qui sont victimes de la malnutrition. Un an après, concrètement, qu'est-ce que la BAT a fait pour ces populations africaines, pour les soulager de, Ma deuxième question... Stop. Il y a d'autres questions. Thank you. 
Oui, deuxième question, c'est... Ah, ah, ok. Yeah, il, faut, il faut demander. Ça va. Oui, ma deuxième question, c'est... On sait que la Banque africaine de développement est sous-capitalisée. Où en, en êtes-vous dans la recapitalisation de la banque Ok. Ah, merci pour, uh, beaucoup pour, pour être venu pour cette uh, discussion. Et tout d'abord, quand il y avait évoqué, vous étiez à Dakar, c'est pas Dakar, à, 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 à Lusaka, où nous avons discuté sur la situation de l'énergie. Et nous avons aussi eu la discussion avec euh, notre gouverneur de la banque. Et l'année passée, il, il nous avons dit que les choses les plus importantes pour eux, c'est pour accélérer les choses sur l'énergie. Quelles sont les choses que nous avons faites sur l'énergie pendant un an Tout d'abord, nous avons créé une vice-présidence dédiée complètement pour l'énergie en Afrique. Et nous sommes le premier et le seul institution multilatérale de finances qui a fait ça. Parce que, comme je vous avais dit, c'est une chose très importante pour nous, c'est la priorité de priorité. Donc, il faut être bien structuré pour pouvoir faire ça. Et ça peut vous intéresser que le les monsieur qui dirige uh, cette vice-présidence, c'est une Sénégalais. Uh, il s'appelle uh, Amadou Hot et il fait excellent travail. Deuxième chose, ce que nous avons fait, l'année passée, nous avons fait une um, uh, 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 approbation de 1,7 milliard de dollars sur le secteur énergie. Uh, uh, 1,7 milliard de dollars. Et nous avons aussi eu effet de levier de 2,5 milliards de dollars dans ce secteur l'année passée. Et cette année, on va passer à 2,3 milliards de dollars dans ce secteur. Ça veut dire qu'on fait beaucoup de progrès uh, dans ce sens. Mais il y a, comme vous le savez, nous savons que l'Afrique est dotée avec beaucoup de ressources énergétiques qui est sous-utilisée. Par exemple, l'énergie renouvelable. Et nous avons uh, travaillé avec le G7 uh, pour créer ce qu'on appelle uh, initiative pour l'énergie renouvelable en Afrique, qui est basée au sein de la Banque africaine de développement et pour laquelle le groupe de G7 a uh, promis de, 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 uh, de donner 10 milliards de dollars. Et ça, c'est l'initiative la plus importante pour l'Afrique parce que c'est uh, une initiative qui a été développée à Paris pendant le COP, uh, COP 21 à, 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 à Paris. Nous avons créé la, uh, cette année un fonds, ce qu'on appelle Facilité pour la, uh, 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 en anglais, Facility for Energy Inclusion. En, uh, en français, Facilité pour l'énergie uh, uh, inclusive. inclusive. Avec le fonds, avec le financement de 500 millions de dollars. Et ce fonds, simplement, c'est là pour aider les petites et moyennes entreprises qui font l'investissement dans l'énergie solaire. Uh, si je prends le Sahel, par exemple, au Niger, au Sénégal, au Tchad, à Mauritanie et partout. Il y a le soleil partout. Il faut l'utiliser, mais les compagnies qui font ça n'ont pas accès au financement abordable pour eux. Donc, nous avons créé cette année ce fonds qui va, qui va le soutenir. Et enfin, nous avons aussi euh, euh, commencé, je pourrais, euh, euh, si tu prends le cas de, de, de euh, le Kenya, par exemple, nous avons fait euh, l'investissement l'année passée euh, pour raccourir les gens qui sont liens de ligne de transmission de 1 million de ménages l'année passée, ah, simplement pour ça. Donc, en gros, le sommet, ce que je peux dire, c'est pour l'année 2016, 3,3 millions des Africains ont bénéficié d'accès à l'électricité à cause de notre accélération de ça. Ça veut dire qu'on est dans, la même, euh, dans les bonnes voies et on est bien préparé pour accélérer les choses. Et le, la deuxième question, c'est... Oui, oui, oui. Bon, je suis vraiment très, très heureux que vous êtes là. J'espère que vous allez amener aussi l'argent pour aussi investir, de, pour investir dans votre banque africaine de développement. Non, on est dans une phase de discuter différents systèmes pour optimiser le ressource de la banque. Je peux vous dire qu'en tant que les, les livraison de le, les résultats, la banque euh, donne beaucoup de résultats d'impact. Parce que ce n'est pas une question simplement d'argent, hein. il faut qu'il y ait un impact. Si je prends par exemple au niveau d'impact, euh, en total pour la banque, en 2016, 3,3 millions de, de, euh, de, de personnes ont eu accès à l'électricité. 3,7 millions de personnes ont eu accès à l'eau et à l'assainissement. Et vous prenez par exemple euh, l'agriculture, 
5,7 millions de personnes ont augmenté la productivité et revenu à cause de notre investissement dans le secteur agricole. Et si vous prenez par exemple en ce qui concerne l'accès à le, à, à, à le service médicaux, 9,3 millions des Africains ont bénéficié de notre investissement l'année passée seulement. Et en ce qui concerne le système routier, le système de transport, 7 millions d'Africains ont bénéficié l'année passée. Ça veut dire que la banque fait l'investissement avec l'impact sur le terrain. Il nous faut bien sûr les ressources pour pouvoir payer plus pour l'Afrique. Il faut accélérer ça et nous avons déjà engagé dans le processus de discussion avec notre euh, euh, gouverneur de la banque euh, dans quelles mesures euh, on peut accélérer les ressources pour la banque pour pouvoir payer plus pour l'Afrique pour que l'Afrique aille plus vite dans le développement. Two last questions, two last questions. I'm P.S. Thapliel from All India Radio. Sir, kindly, uh, will you tell uh, the details regarding states heads and uh, countries and the delegates participating in this meeting? Sorry, I can't... I regarding the details of the state heads, countries and delegates participating in this meeting. Or the details of those participating in the meeting, if I get your question correctly. Is that correct? Okay, yes. Um, we have, um, you know, African heads of state that are participating in this meeting. Uh, President uh, Talon of Benin uh, is going to be here. Uh, we have uh, President Macky Sall of Senegal is going to be here. We also have the Vice President of Côte d'Ivoire, uh, you know, is also uh, uh, here. Uh, Mr. Kablan Duncan is, is, is going to be here. Uh, the, the former President of Ghana, uh, President Mahama, is also here. Um, we're going to have uh, lots of private sector leaders that are going to be here. Aliko Dangote, which is, you know, the, the, the richest black man in the world, is going to be here uh, for this, uh, actually today, for a session later today. And most importantly for me, the most important VIPs for me are actually the, is actually the young people. Because that's what the future of Africa really is. And we have lots of them going to be in this meeting because it's about how we invest in their future. Uh, but as you know, um, Prime Minister Modi is going to be here. And I like Prime Minister Modi very much. I like his style. I like his dynamism. I, I think he's a, he's a pop star. And I think he's using that a lot for India's benefit. And I think I look forward to our interaction with him. And how many delegates are participating? Oh, I think if I, if I add you, um, <laughs> I'm sure we're going to be, that will be about 3,001 if we add you. Hello, hi, um, Dr. Adesina. Um, my name is uh, Jack Aldane. I'm the editor of Development Finance magazine. Uh, I'd just like to ask you, how important do you think that capturing fair and effective tax revenues uh, are to mobilizing the domestic resources that you spoke of earlier? And what are some of the challenges to overcome to get there? You know, um, if you look at the Asian economies that have been developing, their tax to GDP ratio is quite high. In some countries, you look at a tax to GDP ratio almost close to 40%. You look at Europe and so on. The so tax rate is quite important. But in Africa, the tax to GDP ratio is still low. It's about 15%. Right? In some countries, even as low as 4%. And so clearly what has to be done is to expand the fiscal space for countries to be able to mobilize more resources. So better tax administration, expanding the taxable base is going to be very important. Uh, if you look in the total amount of tax, Africa is actually doing better because right now it's about $500 billion that is collected in terms of taxes um, in Africa. But a lot more can be done. A lot more can also be done in terms of reducing corruption at ports. So you can actually get a lot more in terms of duties uh, that has to be uh, uh, that has to be paid. I'll give you an example about what the bank is doing. We invested in, um, in uh, the government of Togo to actually create a, a new tax agency to be able to mobilize taxation for them. Within one year, the revenue collection went up by 25% just because of that. So I think that good tax uh, collection, tax administration is going to be very, very important. But it's not just what you collect, it's how you use what you collect. And so, as a bank, we also focus on knowledge because knowledge is very, very important. We're a knowledge-based bank. And so how to help countries 
in public expenditure uh, management. It's also one area that we invest significant amounts of resources in. And at the end of the day, there are other taxes that we should be collecting that's actually been filtered away you know, because of illegal, uh, illicit transfer of money, you know, uh, base shifting and things like that, that um, you know, multinational companies do. And so the African Development Bank is working to help to reduce these illicit capital flows. Today it's about a little bit over $63 billion that leaves Africa because of uh, these bad practices. And so we are working within the international framework to tighten the, uh, the, the tax code so that you know, what belongs to Africa from its um, minerals, from oil and gas, stays in Africa but doesn't get uh, extracted by others. Mr. President, I am uh, Mehul Dani, Associate Editor from Banking Frontier Magazine, Mumbai. Sir, tell us something about your overall targets of your bank this current financial year and which are the countries other than India you are looking for as a big investor? Sorry, repeat the question. What are the overall targets of your bank this current targets, yeah. uh, this, uh, financial year? And which are the countries apart from India you are looking for forward to as a big, big investor? Oh, okay. All right, thanks. Well, you know, um, in terms of our targets, our targets remain the same. Uh, we focus on high fives. You know, we, we're going to accelerate our work on energy sector, you know, this year significantly. And uh, one of the things we are going to do is to um, help to launch, actually we've launched it already, it's called Off-Grid Revolution, um, you know, Energy Revolution, which is to develop new financing models to take the businesses that are helping uh, people to connect to single solar PV systems in Africa to take them to scale. Now, if you take, for example, like in Kenya, you have a company called uh, MCOPA. And this MCOPA is providing households with one single solar PV system that they pay as they go. They pay $50, but they pay as they go. Now, they've connected 245,000 households to that system. Now, as a bank, we want to reach 75 million households. And so obviously, the task is immense. And so what we decided to do is to work with MCOPA and others, such as Mobisol, which is based in Berlin, and others, so that we can actually help them to do, let's say, 10 times what they are doing now, and then replicate it in about 30 countries. So Africa is in a hurry when it comes to the issue of energy. And so we are going to accelerate a lot of that. The annual meeting this year is focusing on agriculture. And um, last year, we invested in our young people in agriculture. As I told you, agriculture is the is the coolest thing that you can think about. Um, we invested $800 million last year uh, to support businesses of young people in eight countries. And our goal is that in each of these countries, uh, they will uh, support 10,000 graduates in agriculture. And now we want to go to about 30 countries. So we'll accelerate our investments uh, in the area of agriculture. Uh, this year, we will also uh, accelerate our work uh, when it comes to um, a facility we've developed which is called the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa. Um, we'll be signing an MOU sometimes today with the International Finance Corporation or sometimes tomorrow with the International Finance Corporation. Our target is to help to mobilize $3 billion specifically over 10 years uh, for businesses of, uh, 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 of women uh, in Africa. And of course, when it comes to the countries that we're looking at, India obviously continues to be uh, a great investor in Africa. We're working with um, so many countries in the G7. Um, you know, the G20 countries are very important for us. France plays a very, very big role. We're delighted with the new election of President Macron uh, in France. And France has always been a great supporter of the African Development Bank. Germany is a big supporter. As you know, Angela Merkel, Chancellor Angela Merkel, just launched the compact with Africa. And so the African Development Bank is going to play a big role, uh, obviously, in that. And we look forward to also working a lot with Japan, uh, with China, um, with South Korea, with the United States, and the UK government, uh, especially even post-Brexit. We, we are great partners with them. So, I mean, we have 80 countries that are members of the African Development Bank. And our role is to make sure that not only do we get resources from them, 
we have to make sure we expand opportunities for their businesses in their countries to be able to work in Africa. And that's our target through the Africa Investment Forum. Mr. President, the last question is coming from Mozambique. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rodrigues Luis. I'm from Mozambique. Well, Je ne vous entends pas. Il faut que vous montiez. Si, si. Mon nom est Rodrigues Luiz, je viens de Moçambique, travaille pour le journal Notícias. Monsieur le Président, à Dicina... Vous parlez en anglais ou en français Portugais. Je ne peux pas vous entendre. Portugais, vous pouvez vous entendre Non, il ne peut pas. Il ne peut pas. Ok. Mr. Président, mon nom est Richard Mark Mbaram. Je travaille pour Agro Nigeria. I want to find out uh, what mechanisms the Africa Development Bank has put in place um, to incentivize governments within Africa to increase their funding for agriculture from a budgetary perspective. Mm. I say that in view of um, the Maputo Declaration and um, the fact that uh, Hadley has, um, for instance, Nigeria, um, the, big, the biggest economy in Africa, hasn't been able to attain the 10% commitment level that um, they had made, you know, to agriculture. How, how, how is the bank going to be um, working to enhance this? Our thanks for the question. Just to say that when it comes to the issue of investing in agriculture, uh, the, the Maputo Declaration requires the countries to all put in at least 10% of the national budget into, uh, into agriculture. Only a few countries have reached that particular level. Um, and so quite a lot of work needs to, to be done to encourage countries to see agriculture as critical to being able to uh, lift hundreds of millions of people uh, out of poverty. Um, so the African Development Bank will continue, obviously, that's why we have the Feed Africa initiative, to encourage African governments to invest more in agriculture. But as I say, Agriculture is not something for government. Agriculture is a private sector-led activity. And what is needed is to make agriculture a business. And the role of government should be recalibrated all across Africa. The role of government in agriculture should be to create incentives, to provide infrastructure, to provide the right types of policies that will support smallholder farmers. But the role of private sector is to be able to invest all across the agricultural value chain, right? Whether it is in you know, commercial agriculture, whether it's in processing, value addition, logistics, transport, marketing, that's the whole of the private sector. And we at the African Development Bank firmly believe that agriculture should now move to being agriculture as a business. It's not a development activity. It's not just social sector. It's a business that can help to transform all of Africa's rural areas completely, if taken as such. So we'll be encouraging government to do a lot more public-private partnerships, to invest a lot in infrastructure, but also to create the right environment for agribusinesses to invest heavily in Africa. Thank you, Mr. President. So, um, oh, no, no, he wants he, the, you, the guy. You find yes. someone to translate? Yes, okay. Someone who so, has a. So, ask your question. He will uh, my name is Rodrigues Luis, I de Moçambique, I work for the journal Notícias. Senhor Presidente, uma das grandes barreiras que existem para o desenvolvimento agrário são as políticas dos governos africanos. Muitas políticas são erradas e que impedem o desenvolvimento agrário. E este investimento que o Senhor Presidente Adicina anuncia, será que está a acompanhar também essas barreiras políticas que existem a nível dos países africanos? tendo em conta que o doutor Adicida é um dos atores principais já conhece as áreas da agricultura através da revolução uh, a agra, a revolução verde, e a doutora Adicida tem estado, vinha trabalhando para esta organização e com, muito, com, com muita energia, sabe que há barreiras nos países africanos, muitos países africanos. Será que este investimento está sendo levado em conta para afastar as barreiras. Muito obrigado. Yeah, I think that um, when it comes to the barriers that needs to be removed from on the agricultural sector, I think the biggest barrier to agricultural sector in Africa is actually the lenses with which we look at agriculture. 
Because if your lenses, you know, I wear glasses. If my lenses are the wrong lenses, I can't see far. And I think we've been taking agriculture in Africa the wrong way for a long time. We've been taking it as a development activity. We've been taking it as a social sector. And it is not a development activity. And it's not a social sector. If Africa is spending $35 billion importing food today, which will rise to $110 billion by 2025 if we do nothing, it tells you that agriculture is a money-making business. And what African governments should do is to recognize that unless and until they, they fix agriculture, they will be subjecting themselves to a huge amount of macroeconomic and fiscal instability by depending on food imports. And so that's the first thing that has to change, is to recognize that agriculture is a business. And that's what governments have to see it that way. The second thing is that Africa should stop exporting raw materials. What sense does it make that Africa produces today 75% of the cocoa in the world, but it gets only 2% of a $100 billion chocolate market? What is the brain surgery in making chocolates? Africa has no business being at the bottom of the value chain. Africa should get to the top of the value chain and process and add value to everything that it produces. So African governments have to do agricultural industrialization. The third thing that needs to change is how we finance agriculture. The banks are financing oil and gas. The last time I checked, nobody drinks oil. Nobody smokes gas. Everybody eats food. And so we got to make sure we are financing agriculture the right way. Only 3% of total bank lending in Africa goes to agriculture sector. That has to absolutely change if Africa is going to unlock that potential for agriculture. The fourth thing that has to change in terms of, of, of um, obstacle is get young people into agriculture. The average age of farmers today is 60 to 65 years. You are from Angola. I'm sure you know that. If we don't change the composition of the agricultural sector in terms of young people being there to replace old people, in 20 years from now, Africa will have no farmers left. And so that's why the African Development Bank has launched what we call the Enable Youth Program to help to create a new generation of young commercial farmers in Africa. And the African Development Bank strongly believes in agriculture. That's why we are going to be investing $24 billion in the agriculture sector, $24 billion over the next 10 years to help countries to redynamize this critical sector. Sometimes I see people walk past gold, but they think gold is dirt. They think it's sand. That's because you haven't processed. You don't know what's in it. That's what agriculture, agriculture holds the future for Africa, and we, but we must look at it differently than we have today. Thank you, Mr. President. This is the end of our press conference, and allow me again to thank you for coming. Thank you.